Good afternoon, folks. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Lynn Zelesnikar, and I'm an engraver here at Colonial Williamsburg. Um, I was fortunate enough to study my apprenticeship here, and I have uh, been doing engraving now for uh, about uh, 24 years. And uh, one of the things that I've had the pleasure of doing is working with a lot of our other trade shops here. And a major project now is talking about these prints and talking about the copper plates and how these prints were produced. So I thought today we can now talk a little bit more about how the other shops here use these prints. So we're going to let these guys introduce themselves and then we'll get a little farther into this. Right? I'm Paul Zlesnikar. I work at the Wheelwright Shop here at Colonial Williamsburg. And I'm Josh Grammel. I work in the uh, uh, Historic Masonry Trades here at Colonial Williamsburg, a fancy way to say the, uh, the Brickyard. Mm -hmm. And I'm Robin Kitts. I'm the Supervisor of Medical History Programs in the Apothecary. Right. So I've had the pleasure to work with all of these guys very recently on some projects, uh, one of which is um, a particular print that the Wheelwrights and um, the Brickyards have been using. So I, we've got some footage here of sort of the setup and execution to see how these plates are produced. So we're going to show you that and then we'll talk a little more about it. So I'm starting with an image that has been given to me by our brick makers. It's also an image that's being used by our wheelwrights. So we've got an image that's a watercolor, very soft. Uh, we've now got to kind of translate this to a line drawing. So I'm going to lay some tracing paper over this and trace this image out as close as we can and essentially create a skeleton of this design. This is going to give us sort of the bare bones for what will become the actual engraving of that. So the image has been traced out and there we've got sort of the skeletal form of that image itself. This is going to be the basis for the engraving. Pretty much have everything except for the drastic points of shading. That's something that we're going to be adding in um, as we cut this piece. So if we want to reverse this image, uh, some images it is a you know, uh, a required uh, point is to reverse it so when it's printed, it's going to mirror itself in the right direction. Uh, so that point, we're going to put it up to the, uh, to the glass, to the window, and we're going to retrace that through on the opposite side. That's going to give us our reversal. That's the way we're going to trace it out on the copper plate itself. Okay. Now, we need to prepare the plate for the transfer of the design. So I've got a sandbag here, which is going to just give me a little bit of height. We've got a copper plate. Copper is sort of the best choice for this. Uh, it's the one we see most often in the 18th century. Um, this is going to be a sturdy material, a material that's available, uh, but one that's going to hold up well under the actual printing itself. So the plate being uh, smooth, not necessarily to a high shine, but smooth. All the edges on the plate need to be filed, uh, rounded. Uh, smoothed over so when it does go through the press, it's not going to shear the paper off. Now, we need a base. We need to change that slick surface to something a little more textured. So what I've got here is just white watercolor. White watercolor is going to give us nice and uh, flat uh, image surface here. Think of it like a piece of paper now. Once we get a decent film, this is going to be left for quite some time to dry nicely. Okay. Now, while that's drying, I'm going to need to prepare some carbon paper to create our transfer. This is the paper that's going to go behind the image. This is going to allow uh, the markings to adhere to the watercolor. So I've got some uh, charcoal here, and we're just going to blacken this sheet out. We're not going to do but just a small section here to show you. Okay, so our watercolor has dried and now we're going to layer this up with uh, carbon paper. This will give you a good sense of how this is going to all come together. Carbon paper lays down on the watercolor and we're going to put down the drawing and now we're going to trace some of this through here. And this will give you a sense. Now this is going to take some time, especially a drawing this size. We want to be meticulous, but we're going to trace a bit of this through and see if our marks show. All right, so we're going to move our drawing. 
and our carbon paper, and we can get a, a very small section here where you can kind of get an idea of that image coming through. Now we've already done this on the other side to size, so we can, we've reduced actually this image a little bit since our plate was a bit smaller. But that's the sense of, again, that skeleton of the image, this is what we're now gonna be cutting over. So now that we've got the plate set up with the image on there, now we need to start executing the actual engraving. Now the method we're gonna be using for this is using what's called a burn. Uh, this is a hand carving tool. This is certainly something we see in the 18th century. Let's cut some of this so you get a sense of how this takes. Plate like this is gonna take some time. All right. So um, we're gonna be showing you just a fraction of what might take a image like this, um, probably a good 10 hours or more. So I am gonna put some paper down where my hands are touching near the image because we don't wanna smear that away. So I've put a little bit of oil on the end of the burn. This is a steel tool, very sharp, kind of goes in the palm of the hand here and we're very gently gonna push that through. Now the steel is sharp enough that it is going to carve through very easily. It's just a matter of mastering how to manage the tool and guiding that through. So that copper has exited. So we are carving directly into that metal. Anywhere there's an incision, and that's the whole point of this, is this is where the ink is going to hold when the printer gets a hold of it. Now we're gonna have to move the plate as well as our hands as we move through. The plate will not be viced because we want shallow cuts, but we need to be able to move them so it's a nice fluid cut. Once all the outlines are completed, then we'll start working in shading. Basically, if we look at it like a pen and ink drawing, the areas that we want to appear darker or to have more of a, a grayscale in the actual printing, we're gonna work with um, not so much depth, but concentration lines. We want the lines to get closer together or we start overlapping those lines. All right, so now that you've got a little bit of a view of how those plates are produced and how we sort of get to that point, um, once they're ready, then we're gonna print them. And so we've got an image to show you of a uh, printing press. And this is gonna be quite different than the way our printers do here at Colonial Williamsburg. They're using letterpress, so they're um, doing typeset. So we need something that's gonna be able to essentially retrieve the ink from the cut areas. So the press we've got here, a copper plate press or a rolling press, what the printer is going to do is they're going to take that plate, they're going to warm it a bit, they're going to apply the ink, which is quite thick and sticky. That's going to sort of melt it and let it get into all of those cut areas. They're going to gently scrape away the excess. Um, they're going to um, then buff that plate by, uh, with their bare hand. They're going to buff it clean. So the top of that surface is going to be um, smudge free. The plate itself goes on the bed of that rolling press. Damp paper goes over top of it. And then some cushioning, usually a couple of wool blankets. Now when the pressman that you see on the left side gets that hand and foot in there and really turns that wheel, what's happening is the bed itself is feeding under that roller. The roller itself is just really mashing down very hard on that cushioning, forcing the paper into the cuts to pull up that ink. So when the one print is pulled, and you can see the others in the background there on the uh, image, uh, they're gonna be hung to dry. So that's one print. So this is a, a kind of almost like an assembly line. Uh, we're gonna have several people working on each one at, at a time. Now we've been pretty fortunate here at Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, when I got started with this project, uh, we didn't have any way to print the plates that we were uh, producing and we were fortunate that uh, some of our donors came through for us. So we have a modern table um, size version of that same principle, it's just all steel. So it does give us that opportunity. So where we kind of got started with this is, um, oh gosh, probably about 10 years or so ago, we did a program called Metalworking for Revolution. 
And the first print we were able to produce, uh, The Boston Massacre, which was originally done by Paul Revere. So we've got a couple of images of that, the copper plate itself, then we'll have another image of it, the first print as it looks uncolored. Um, so again, when we print them, it's going to be a black and white. So think of it like a coloring book page. And then the last picture is going to be the colorized version of that. Now this particular image, the plate itself, took about 63 hours to, to hand carve. It does take a bit of time to cut each one of them. And certainly that's going to depend a lot on um, the information that we have to get in there, how much uh, engraving has to go into it. And sometimes, too, the size of the plate will affect that as well. Now, the one in the video you saw was a specific uh, image that we're using currently. And this is one suggested by our brickmakers and one also our wheelwrights are using. The original was done by a man named Pine, who does a lot of rural images. So, Josh, when you, we talked about this, um, you know, how, it, how do you use an image like this and how do you even find images like this? Um, yeah, for us, we, uh, we consider ourselves pretty lucky that we have this pine drawing. It's from about 1803 uh, of a brickyard, um, you know, in operation. It's got a young lady pulling what seems to be a very, very massive wheelbarrow and these hack barrows. Uh, as they're called for, uh, for moving bricks in a brickyard, uh, just, um, you know, could be moving 50, 60, 70 bricks at a time. So they're, they're very, very heavy duty um, uh, wheelbarrows. And, um, you know, the, the thing to remember about uh, brickyards is uh, they're very, very functional places. They're, uh, they're, they're not magnificent works of art. So having an illustration of a brickyard from a time period is pretty important for us. And even better, the foreground image of the, uh, the young lady with the, the wheelbarrow is cool enough, but in the background you actually see a device called a pug mill, um, which uh, was used by the early uh, 19th century for mixing clay up in a brickyard. And we're in the, uh, the preliminary stages of, uh, of maybe designing one of these and maybe having one at Colonial Williamsburg someday, fingers crossed. Um, but, um, but having this, uh, this image from the, uh, the time period is very, very important for us and actually something very cool for us. Yeah. And Josh, you brought up accuracy, which is such a huge part of you know, us using these as resources. And then, of course, we have to think of the information that's been given during the 18th century. Mm -hmm. you know, how do they receive that you know, information? And this was a question that I actually brought to you, Paul, was it didn't look right to me. The image itself looked very out of... Um, out of proportion uh, between the young woman and the wheelbarrow itself. Yeah, I mean, the Pine's images are valuable, as I think we've already commented on, but uh, wheelbarrows come in a huge variety of sizes. It's very possible that it's a very big wheelbarrow. It's also very possible <laughs> that it's a very little human pulling it. Um, we're taking proportions off of that image to determine the height of the wheel, which helps us determine the length of the piece. And there's some details in there about joinery and other aspects that we find very important in, uh, in reproducing things for use here at Colonial Williamsburg. Right. And Robin, you've brought a very interesting image to show. Um, and this one really hits a home run with accuracy here. Um, and so if you introduce that and talk about that, because this is one of my favorites. Oh, it is. It's one of mine, too. Thank you. So this is a 1515 woodcut that was done by the German artist Albrecht Dürer. And it's a classic case of what the artist renders when they don't have a live or stuffed subject in this case. Um, he had never seen a rhinoceros. All he had to work on was a written description and a sketch. So this is what he comes up with. And it's great when you look at it because he has a little horn in the middle of his neck and this, instead of folds of skin it looks like plates and check out those toes, those are great. Um, so it was widely um, reprinted, people loved it. Um, there's an original in the um, Society of Apothecaries um, headquarters in London today. Mm. So it's, it's a great print. By contrast, there are other cases when accuracy is extremely important when right. it comes to medical illustration. Right. And we had an opportunity very recently this summer to work on uh, two different engravings for our apothecary shop on their request. So we'll start with one of those images, a side view of the jaw. And, um, you know, these were very interesting but almost kind of strange because not knowing that anatomy that well you know it was diving into something that's incredibly complicated right and um 
you know, these two particular images. Uh, actually, you chose them for us. And where did those particular images come from, first off? Those are great prints. So they were commissioned by um, John Hunter, who was a Scottish surgeon who had his own private school of teaching anatomy in London. And these particular prints were published in his textbook on history of the teeth, um, which was published in the 1770s. So this was part of his curriculum for teaching anatomy to the students at the time. And he definitely would have given his artists actual specimens. He's noted as having something done like over 14,000 anatomical specimens in the 18th century. Um, but when you talk about accuracy, I love your comment about what your dentist said when. Right. <laughs> I was at a big concern about these because, again, not knowing that anatomy closely, um, there was a few marks on there that was questionable, and we thought, well, maybe this is a misprint or maybe it was an uh, unusual cut that, you know, you know, I don't know. We needed to figure it out just to be sure. So I did. I took them to a dental appointment after I had my teeth cleaned and showed them to my very modern dentist. And she said they would have held up in schools today. I mean, they're very accurate. And uh, it was kind of a, whew, thank goodness. <laughs> um, but it was very exciting to hear that, to hear that they were that accurate. And um, just, you know, such a great resource and a great resource for you, for you to use. Which we appreciate a lot. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so what are some other images, especially in the medical field? It's pretty detailed. What are some other images or other you know, directions that you're going to look for those prints and use them? So one of the other things we like to do is go through the 18th century um, textbooks. And with healthcare, 18th century, we've been blessed with an incredible number of extant textbooks. Um, so some of the prints are um, very accurate with anatomy, and some of them are more artistic, where we see people doing surgery and the patient is sitting there very calmly. <laughs> <laughs> and it's something like somebody's doing a, a surgery on somebody's head, trepanning a fractured skull, drilling a hole, and there's just one hand on, on the skull, and you know there would be more than that. Um, but they're, they're valuable because without photographs, um, a lot of times all we have is just the written word or the artifacts from the period. So the, um, the insight from the prints are invaluable. Now, the medical world is, is very rich with those kinds of images, and not so much with the brickyard. That is correct. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there is not a whole lot of uh, imagery when it comes to, uh, to, to brickyard scenes. We, uh, we are lucky enough that we've got um, a scene from Pine, uh, the same guy who did the young lady with the, uh, the wheelbarrow. Uh, and it's uh, two gentlemen pulling, gentlemen, two brickmakers, uh, pulling down a, a kiln. Um, and we sometimes compare that or contrast that with, uh, with another image we've got of, uh, of not so much a brickyard, but a tile yard related trade uh, from the mid 18th century from a gentleman named Diderot who um, drew up a, a really fantastic um, encyclopedia in the mid 18th century. He, uh, he is French, so, uh, so there might be some differences in, uh, in the, the trades due to uh, um, you know, where something is taking place, France versus, uh, versus England. Uh, but if you take a look at, um, yeah, at uh, Diderot's image of a, um, of a tile yard, the, um, the, the guy making the, the, the tile is within a building that is, has been constructed out of either brick or stone. Um, everything is laid out in the sun to dry very, very neatly, very pristinely. Everything is, well, neat and clean. He's, <laughs> he's tucked in. He's wearing a coat. Um, it's, a, it's a very idealized view um, of, uh, of brick making. And one that doesn't really strike us as being true from that standpoint but the work being done is accurate, whereas Pine shows um, uh, life in a brickyard maybe a little more the way it was. Uh, these guys are a little less well-dressed. They're not all tucked in. Um, the, um, uh, there's piles of dirt um, you know, visible around them. Their, um, uh, their materials, their, uh, their ladder is just laying on the ground. So I suspect that, uh, that Pine actually visited a brickyard and had sketches or uh, was able to, uh, to, um, to, to see work going on in a, a brickyard. Whereas Diderot, well, he was a little more of a gentleman. Maybe he was hearing about how brick making worked and then was illustrating that for his audience rather than um, a view of the, the, the way a brick maker's life probably would have looked. Now, in this clean. particular one, when I completed it, we sat down and kind of talked about it because I had some questions and some questions that even our visitors had proposed was looking at that, you know, two, two men 
with the stack of bricks there, are they taking it down? Are they putting it up? So we're not, not just looking at the vehicles <laughs> there that Paul has to look for, mm -hmm. but it, you know, is that telling you something, the direction and sort of you know, how that information is, you know, what it's conveying? Right, yeah, um, it's, uh, it's very rare to, to see a kiln, honestly, in, in an 18th century or an early 19th century uh, illustration. So having one that's, you're seeing the guts of the kiln is really, really impressive right. for us. Um, and uh, yeah, when you, when you look at that, uh, that illustration, you think, are these guys stacking the kiln in preparation for burning it, or have they burned it and they're pulling it down? Um, from, from what we can tell, it looks like they are pulling it down. Uh, just from the, uh, the way their, their wheelbarrows are uh, oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that it looks a little rickety, what that guy is standing on <laughs> is not well stacked anymore. That kind of makes me think that, uh, that it, was, uh, it has been burned, which now that we, uh, we have this, uh, this colorized image that, uh, that you were able yeah. to produce for us, um, we made sure that the, uh, the, the bricks were the right color. They, uh, yeah. they look like they've been burned. Um, they're you know, now in orangey red like they should be. That was a second major question. Was, <laughs> I was just haphazardly coloring it, just you know, what I thought off the top of my head, but it was, <laughs> there is a major difference between those colors you know, when it's fired, when it's unfired. And then you and I, Paul, started discussing <laughs> colors on the, the cart that's yeah. in there. So what is, it, what is that particular image telling you about uh, the cart and um, the things that the brickmakers need? And the colors. Well, you're looking at the cart. I mean, it's a pretty standard horse cart for the time. Um, relatively tall wheels balanced out for the horse. Um, those are all factors you have to really think about when one is building a cart, designing a vehicle, is the height of the animal, the intended purpose of the vehicle. Uh, when you showed me the colorized image, the blue stuck out, which I thought was great. Blue carts are very common. Uh, and then those yellow wheels kind of struck me, and that's, right. that's kind of an unusual color combo. So if I had a criticism, <laughs> far be it for me to criticize another tradesman, but uh, those yellow wheels were a little off-putting. I think we can work on that. I think we can work on that. I think that's a doable that. thing. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about, you know, all these different images and sort of, you know, how we're using them and where we're going with them. Um, you know, maybe talk about the things that we can't, do today, you know, because there's certainly some of those, um, some of that information that it's great, we would like to reproduce that here at Colonial Williamsburg as a museum, but sometimes that's just not very possible. Um, what are some instances, especially apothecary, I think about some of the things you do are uh, a little dangerous in some cases. What would you so, change or what could you change? <laughs> yeah, we're only allowed to be authentic to a point. So right. no mercury, no arsenic or lead in the shop, although it would be more accurate if we were, but we just do not have it. But yeah, well, back to your prints. One of the interesting things, the 18th century, if you're teaching anatomy, you're going to be doing dissections. You're oh, going to be yeah. doing live surgery. There's directions on how to make wet and dry specimens because they're super into pathology and just learning how the disease how it affects you externally is also affecting you internally. And then they figure out that later by dissection. And, and we, we take that for granted today. But that's, that's sure. new news, 18th century. Um, and then using prints. So unfortunately, at the apothecary, we can't do any of that. But we do have a reproduction skeleton. And we do oh. have prints. So we can talk about teaching anatomy using those. But unfortunately, no live surgeries. No live surgeries. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand that, I guess. <laughs> So what about you guys? Is there any particular things that w we have to make modern adjustments for that, you know, because we are a modern consumer in a museum? What uh, do you think? Yeah, for, uh, for us, uh, that, uh, that image of the, uh, the, the guys pulling apart the kiln, um, that is the, the way it's done. Um, you're standing on top of a stack of bricks and throwing bricks down to the, uh, the guy uh, below you. Uh, we can't really get away with that anymore. Um, there are some safety issues, naturally. Um, so nowadays we, uh, we put up and pull down the kilns here at Colonial Williamsburg with a little bit of scaffolding. And uh, luckily our, uh, our guests have always been, uh, been very understanding of that because we don't want to come down to a brickyard and see a bunch of guys laying on the ground because they've broken their legs, oh, no. which is no good for anybody. Um, so, uh, so yeah, uh, from, a, from an occupational safety uh, standard, um, we're doing a little better than those folks in the, uh, the pine illustration are doing, I'm happy to say. So Paul, is there any major risk factors or is it um, you have to make adjustments because we, we are using a lot of our vehicles to carry modern consumers? 
you know, we let people. We have a lot of very. Place. We have a lot of hidden secrets with our carriages. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to talk about. Okay. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what it is, it's, it's uh, we're putting modern bearings inside the wheels uh, because of the frequency of use in our carriages. Uh, our horses are much more expensive, and they're rare breeds, so we don't want to tucker them out too much. Uh, so a modern bearing is put inside the coach wheels. Uh, our roads in town today are asphalt, as opposed to the 18th century roads, which were dirt here in Williamsburg. And that puts a toll on the wheels. So we're doing a lot more maintenance and repair on our coaches than I think the average shop did historically. Well, I have another question, and the, the vehicles themselves, mm -hmm. you know, there's certainly lots of images of carriages and stuff, but is there really any how-tos, you know, um, how do you take a, 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 an engraving like that and then try to fit it with the proportions to, to build something like that, or just even the wheels themselves? Carriages are a different animal than wagons and carts. The problem with wagons and carts is there are very few surviving originals from this period, so we do have to rely on artwork for that. Mm -hmm. When we go with that, we'll go with proportions based on surrounding objects or the height of the animal, or in the case of Colonial Williamsburg, knowing the heights of animals that are going to be pulling the vehicle, we can then proportion the wheels to that height so that the animal's pulling less weight. From the height of the wheel, we can proportion the rest of the vehicle based on that. Carriages are a little easier, actually, because carriages, there's a lot of surviving carriages from the period, you know. The bummer for us is it requires us going overseas. <laughs> so uh, little, one of those things, is, <laughs> right. it's a little trickier because there's, there's not a lot of surviving carriages from the 1770s that I'm aware of in uh, the United States. So what we have to rely upon then is artwork. And you brought one illustration. Right? Yeah, and what's uh, coming up now is an image from the 1790s from a treatise coach building by William Felton. Um, this is actually a carriage we have running around. It's, it's a traveling coach. Uh, the Carter coach, if you've ever heard of that, uh, is used in town. These are prints that would have been published and provided to coach makers here in North America. Uh, it's a silhouette of the vehicle to give you a, a basic notion of the design, the basic uh, profile of the vehicle. And if you look very carefully, there's a little scale on the bottom under the rear wheel, that's the big wheel. That scale is what we can use to provide to give us the dimensions based on all the other parts. Carriages are customizable vehicles. So that's giving us a basic template of what we can work off of. And then from there, the customer tells us exactly what they require in terms of details. Uh, some of these prints are also painted, so we know what the fashionable colors were at the time, uh, depending on the year. So we, we don't live exclusively in an age where color and design are changing at a moment's notice. They did that in the 18th century, too. Now, um, we've been talking about engraving specifically, but you did bring an interesting image. It was actually a painting um, that you've used that's got some wheelbarrow. Yeah, I didn't do my homework very well. We're supposed to provide yeah, an uh, engraving, so I invited a, a painting instead because <laughs> I'm just a wheelwright. Uh, that's a painting from the 1620s. We had a, a, a museum, a local museum, that wanted uh, a couple of wheelbarrows, and they provided the painting. And if you look down in the lower left corner uh, is the wheelbarrow itself. That, if you look at the actual image of the painting, is probably three-quarters of an inch long. It's tiny, tiny. So we've had to blow the, build, the thing up to look at it. And then from the surrounding objects, I could determine the height of the wheel and the other dimensions of the wheelbarrow. The other image that we've got is the wheelbarrow that I, re I created based on the image. Um, so I mean, that's, that's, we have to do a lot of creative work in our shop uh, because of these types of work vehicles just simply don't exist anymore. They've been worked into the ground. Now, we've gone in a couple of different directions with this, but I'm sure you and I have questions, and certainly feel free to, um, you know, throw those questions out there. We'd love to answer them. Mm -hmm. um, in the meantime, you know, one of the things I'd like to bring up is tools. Um, we all have very specific tools for our trade, and sometimes those tools don't exist anymore, and we rely on images like these to either get them reproduced or get something as close as we can. How does it affect in your trade, especially in the medical field? So yes, there's catalogs for medical instrument makers, and the blacksmiths and our master toolmakers have made us a number 
uh, reproductions. But one of the most um, interesting ones we thought recently mm -hmm. is we found an illustration of a spatula um, used for spreading ointments um, in, a in a, a dictionary written for lay people. Mm -hmm. And um, we were asking people at other museums if they've ever, they said, no, they've never seen one. And we think these actually got repurposed, maybe by artists, so we can't find any extant ones, except we do have an original print. And the blacksmiths, bless their hearts, made us a reproduction. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and for, uh, for us, I mean, uh, brick making uh, tools, there aren't too many of them, but uh, we're also the brick layers here. And uh, the, the brick laying tools honestly haven't changed a whole lot in a couple thousand years for, uh, um, for what, they, uh, what purpose they serve. And you go, you go to a modern mason today and you ask to see their trowel and there are patterns that, uh, that exist and everybody buys more or less the same uh, three or four patterns, London pattern, Philadelphia pattern, those are all established by the mid-19th century. Before then, it's just rhyme or reason. So any illustrations we have of trowels uh, that, uh, that show up uh, just seem to be at the whim of whatever blacksmith was hired to make that particular tool. And, uh, and that's actually um, been, uh, been kind of um, one of the cool things about having things reproduced here at Colonial Williamsburg is, um, you know, we're able to, to take those illustrations that sometimes exist and uh, have the, uh, the blacksmiths make up a, a tool there. But otherwise, sometimes they'll, uh, they'll just kind of freestyle something as, uh, as simple as a trowel. And uh, there is no pattern, no rhyme or reason. So every bricklayer is a little different. Some people like a really long trowel, some people like a short trowel. They can, uh, they can customize it as well as they could have in the, uh, the 18th century, which, uh, which works really well for us, because then you're comfortable with that tool. What about wheelwright, Brooke? Uh, the tools vary. Uh, or there's some change depending on where the trade is being practiced, when the trade is being practiced. So we have to do a little more homework because uh, some of these tools as woodworking tools can be repurposed into the carpentry field uh, or other woodworking trades. So we've had to sit down with the blacksmiths and uh, look at other images like Diderot. I mean, Diderot as an encyclopedia not only reproduced images of uh, masonry trades, but he has a, a wheelwright and coach building section. And he's got some weird tools there. Uh, <laughs> some of the tools, I'm not sure if they would even be practical or not in the work. But then I look at, you know, YouTube's a wonderful thing. The, the <laughs> internet is a wonderful thing for our line of work in, in trades. Uh, preservation and that we can look at other ways of looking at things and there's a lot of uh, clips of these wheelwrights that were filmed in the early 20th century from all over the world practicing these trades and some of them are using these tools that are like I saw that that was in Diderot <laughs> and the guy's using it so where I thought before eh, it's, you know it's not gonna work this guy's actually using it so then we have to backtrack and go, okay, well, would they have been using it here in Virginia in 1775? If the answer is yes, then, you know, we, we talk to our friends at the blacksmith shop. The answer is no. We have to kind of go back to the drawing board and figure something out. I've, uh, one of the images I've got is actually an engraving of an engraving shop. And um, this is one kind of like you guys are doing. We're, we're using those same resources, <laughs> our engraving shop is uh, relatively new. And so in the image here, one unusual piece of tooling equipment that we're getting produced right now is the screen above the engraver working on the right-hand side there. And it's an unusual one, but it's a, a filter for light. And it makes it easier on the engraver's eyes to, to make the best use of pretty direct sunlight. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we're doing the same, you know, really looking at all these different resources and, and trying to decide, you know, what's going to be best for our shop here and what's comparative to, you know, 18th century here in Virginia. Right. Any questions we might have? Yeah, certainly. Thank Excellent. you all. We, we do have a number of questions uh, that have come in. I think we'll start with Diane, who, who, who kind of takes us back to the beginning of this whole process. And she wants to know, would the engraver usually create the original artwork, or is it some other artist that's doing that? How does that, how does that all work? That's a great question. Um, probably more likely not, but yes in some cases. So yeah, we got a very vague answer there. Um, the engraver, there's some debate in the 18th century even among uh, other artists, is an engraver even considered an artist? Um, and in some cases they considered them copiers. But then you have certain 
engravers like William Hogarth or you know even Paul Revere who's who gets into engraving he's doing the images as well as um, the engravings themselves so it can kind of ride that line a little bit both directions um, it's case by case uh, I've actually I brought an image to um, an Algonquin image uh, the original was done by John White and this is a really good example of You've got two different craftsmen looking at the same image. Um, the image on the screen on the right is the original watercolor, which was done uh, by John White. And if you're familiar with the Roanoke colony or the Lost Colony, uh, John White was uh, the governor of that colony. And he was an incredible artist and, and actually did some really, probably most lifelike depictions of natives uh, that he was encountering, as well as fish and other things. Um, but on the left-hand side there, you've got the engraving. Uh, this is the copy of the engraving that we produced here at Colonial Williamsburg. But you can see they're definitely the same image, but there's some, there's some differences. You've got on the right, John White, who's got that subject in front of him and is painting him from life. And then on the left there, the uh, engravings were done by Theodore de Bry. Now, de Bry is in England, and has never seen these folks in the flesh. So now he's kind of reinterpreting them. It's sort of like playing grapevine. Everybody's going to kind of put their own twist to it. And one thing to notice is, is, you know, you're looking at that image, you can definitely see muscular structure and some things are a little sharper. Um, tattooing sometimes looks different and facial features don't look quite as soft. So the engravings can kind of look a little harsh. So. How about for the rest of you, does that question ever come up in your heads I and mean, you look at an engraving and say this was clearly the original artwork was clearly done by somebody who knows my trade versus yeah there's some there's some stuff that's sort of fudged here that this guy didn't there's some helpful information here but they didn't really know what they were talking about yeah that happens in uh, in brick making and it's because we have such a a small field to choose from when it comes to, to brick uh, making images. There is one illustration, and I wish I had brought it now that I'm going to mention it, um, but it's a kiln that basically looks like a skyscraper. Um, this, uh, this thing was, uh, was enormous. And I can only think that the guy, the, the artist producing that, uh, that engraving was being told what a kiln looked like mm -hmm. rather than seeing one in, in the flesh because they don't seem to top more than, you know, um, 10 or 12 feet tall, but this thing looked like the equivalent of a three-story building. It had uh, scaffolding running all the way up, almost like a ziggurat. And uh, it's, um, it kind of makes you scratch your head. It's, um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really cool image. Um, again, I wish I'd brought it. Um, but uh, <laughs> the, um, uh, the, the, the fact that it is so wildly inaccurate, but just close enough that you think, uh, if only he had been able to see it or the person describing it had maybe looked at the image before he, uh, you know, he pulled that print. I think that would have been um, uh, probably best. And Robert, we talked a little bit about it, but that's that's definitely could be two diff two separate fields, right? You've got artists that are sitting in surgeries, you know, maybe even, you know, that is their entire job is to create the depictions, and then they're, you know, might be farming that work out to an engraver who may not have mm -hmm. been had access right. to that same experience, right? Yeah. Yeah, so. That could be a little scary. Right? Especially if, Again, if you're a student and you're trying to absorb yeah. this information and you get it just a little wrong because the picture is just mm -hmm. a little wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That could be scary. Yeah. <laughs> a couple of technical questions on okay. the, the printing side of things. Uh -huh. uh, Bob D was wondering how thick is the, the plate that you're engraving on? And then Howard was wanting to know if the plates wear out. Oh, yes, they definitely wear out. Um, you know, in thickness on the plate actually can kind of affect that to a degree. Um, best way to describe the thickness, it needs to be close to the size of a penny, the thickness of a penny. Uh, if it gets too thin, the pressure under that roller of the press starts to bow the plate. So it can, um, it can wreck the plate over, over time. Now, the plates themselves being copper, copper is a malleable metal, so there's going to be some change in that shape and the movement of the plate over time. So we definitely know and we see corrections being made. We see retouch-ups uh, and we'll, we'll see some of that show up in the prints themselves. Um, but that constant rolling over that image, it starts to essentially just kind of mash that copper down. But luckily there's you know, the opportunity for those recuts. 
shelf life of a plate, it really depends on how much it's being printed. Um, it could be also how well they're taking care of the plate. Um, and usually, you know, when folks are interested in that, they want to you know how many prints. Well, it could be, you know, a few dozen to quite a few hundred. Again, sort of just depending on how well you take care of it. Christine um, has a question about uh, copper plate printing for a fabric. Is it a similar oh, yeah. process? And maybe for, for you, from the engraving point of view, mm -hmm. are you making decisions differently as you render an image uh, that you know it's going to go to fabric? Yeah. It's actually something um, my apprentice is working on right now. Uh, we definitely see copper plate being used in fabric printing. Um, it's not a, a long-term um, process with the flat plate. It seems like that exhausts itself after, I think it's like 20, 30 years or so. And then they'll move from a copper plate to a copper roller. So it makes the printing process a bit more efficient, uh, faster. And also too, kind of think about if you were using a flat plate, having to line that up each time that it's set up on the press. Um, but again, this is something, it's exciting because our we don't know much about it and uh, my apprentice and our weave shop, uh, one of the apprentices over there, this is a joint project they're going to be working on well into next year and we're going to try to reproduce some of that. Uh, I would say the engraving part of it is probably the easy part because um, engraving the plate is just going to be like engraving any other plate. Um, but yeah, certainly you're going to be thinking about how that image is going to convey. Um, but the dyeing process, that's a whole nother game and um, something that we're going to be exploring more this next year. So you'll have to come in and see how far we get with it. One last question mm -hmm. about the plate um, from, from Jean or Jean. Is the copper plate annealed or hardened in any way before? It's oh, finished? excellent. Um, they, certainly a soft plate is going to kind of, I won't say destroy itself, but it's definitely going to affect it and it's not going to wear as well. So we don't want an exceptionally hard plate. Um, so when we get uh, a sheet of copper, even today, because we're not always entirely sure how, you know, how it's been processed. Usually we're getting rolled sheet metal today. The 18th century it possibly could have been rolled sheet metal or it could have been hammered out, um, which could definitely change the way it feels. But when we prepare them, uh, sometimes we'll intentionally harden the, the top surface some. Uh, we've planished them. So what that means is we've taken a small hammer and we've hammered the entire face of it before we've smoothed uh, the plate down, which kind of gives it a little more toughness there. And sometimes when we're you know, kind of pre-polishing, we'll go through with a tool called a burnisher, which is a real polished piece of steel, and we'll rub that surface over pretty good uh, multiple times, which will help kind of give a little extra hardness to the top side. So definitely not uh, dead soft, uh, but uh, you can control that hardening. And I'm sure every engraver kind of has their own approach to it. So Howard has a question that's maybe a little off topic, but maybe also a little mm -hmm. on, since we're talking about engraving and mm -hmm. anatomy, and we've got tradespeople here. Yeah. Did men have tattoos in the 18th century? And <laughs> were there sources, for, were there printed sources for designs and things like that? Uh, well, we saw with the Algonquin <laughs> tattoos. That's so. true. Um, yeah, I mean, tattooing <laughs> goes back, uh, I've uh, been able to discover it as far back as brick making, so about 6,000 years. Uh, in terms of printed flash, we really don't see that becoming a thing until the uh, sort of the last quarter of the, of the 19th century. Um, so, uh, so really what we have are descriptions oftentimes in the newspaper when folks have run off and uh, they mm -hmm. describe a tattoo. Um, my favorite being there is somebody in the Virginia Gazette who runs off at one point and his tattoo is uh, described. He's, it said he is, uh, he is pricked on the arm. Um, they don't use the term tattoo really uh, until the, uh, the early 19th century. Um, but, um, but the design that they, uh, they give is a heart with a dart through it. So the old, uh, uh, you know, cartoon version of a tattoo exists even in the 18th century. No word on whether or not it said mom, but that is a design that existed in the, uh, the 18th century, and I love it. Um, and then occasionally you'll find people who have uh, their own initials and then uh, random numbers on them. They never seem to be years when they're described, so it's not 1747 on somebody's uh, arm. It's just the number 47, and we don't know what those, uh, those would have meant, but tattoos are always very personal. Yeah, and I'm sorry, my first job was as a fact checker on a, uh, an exhibit on tattooing uh, about 20 years ago, so I was prepared to discuss that without knowing it. Perfect, thank you, yeah. 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 Um, you, I think 
everybody, well, Josh in particular, you, you took us all the way back to the beginning of time. Johnny maybe doesn't want to go quite that far back, but he's wondering how, when did engraving get its start in sort of the form that you do it? Oh, okay. Um, um, it is a question that we get sometimes. Engraving, you could even say, is probably the oldest art form, you know, mm. kind of scoring designs into stone or into wood, you know. But the formal engraving that we're doing with a tool called a burin, which is a hand carving tool, um, we're looking at about 1430. And uh, think of some of the you know, classic artists, they're going to be using this to reproduce uh, paintings, to mass produce them. Um, etching, uh, which is a chemical process that's done al almost side by side, it, it gets to start just slightly later. Um, but it, these are two methods that are going to be around for a really long time. And there's quite a few more. Um, these are two that we mostly talk about um, in the shop. So it's a pretty old art form. Um, it's one that will not change very much. Uh, the tooling, the approach, the way um, the you know, designs are kind of looked at, it's something that's pretty consistent. In tools, probably we won't see much of a change until well into the 20th century. And then you can kind of debate on you know, modern lighting and things like that, which will improve it. But um, not as practiced as much anymore, the, the hand carving of uh, engravings. Um, but still being used, and for the same purpose. Uh, if you check out the Bureau of Engraving and Printing in Washington, D.C., our money plates are still, uh, the masters are still cut this way today. And usually on uh, the website for them, you can see some footage of that. Did engravers apprentice like other trades? Were they in high demand? This is Diane is, is curious yeah. about this. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Um, figure, uh, much like most of our trades, we're looking at an average probably about seven years. Most of them are th starting around 13 or 14, pretty young. Um, it's, it's not a real physical trade, but it's definitely a trade where you're going to be looking at your kid, hoping that they have a good eye for it, that they're, <laughs> you know, capable of drawing. And, um, you know, it's, it's a long apprenticeship to learn how to look at things like an engraver rather than maybe looking at things like a... Um, like a painter, because it's a very different approach to it. Um, then some of the engravings uh, of engravers, uh, one thing that's kind of interesting if you kind of look, especially in the print that we have uh, in the background, there are some um, models, and much like an art student would do today, sort of practicing off of those models. So it, it's definitely very much an apprentice trade. And uh, our apprenticeship today, the one I teach today, is, it's a six-year program, and uh, my apprentice uh, just... Um, started his third year. Mm -hmm. I think for you others, uh, since you all lead shops and have apprentices mm -hmm. coming on from time to time, how do engravings factor into your teaching? I mean, are you, are you mm -hmm. expecting them to go out and, and find new things or <laughs> learn how to interpret these things? Or how do you use them in that capacity? Well, Robin, you, you're bringing in modern students. <laughs> We're them. bringing I modern think that's students, right. Well, we currently have two um, 1740s engravings that are reproduced and that are on display in the shop and they're anatomical um, prints and so we talk about again the study of anatomy is important and then some people come in and go well you know I thought dissections were illegal in the 18th century it's like no no they go way back so for grins we also have a copy of Vesalius's 16th century anatomical text with gorgeous pictures in it. So trying to give perspective to get rid of some of these misconceptions at the time. Wait, wait, and would then, you say they're kind of precursors to Gray's Anatomy, which some people might be... That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Precursors to the modern ones. Yeah. And then we were just talking about there's copies of the original medical certificates in the shot. And we were talking that's about true. the gorgeous art around the borders mm -hmm. um, of those. And so those are in the Colonial Williamsburg yeah. um, collection. And it's basically, it's a documentation that one of the apothecaries um, actually had completed training in London on top of his apprenticeship. But I think we should do this. I think that would be great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that would be fantastic. <laughs> right. I think we have time for one last question. Sure. I, I think you sort of just dipped your toes in those waters. Um, <laughs> since we have every, all of you here together and kind of put Lynn on the spot, are there th things that you want Lynn to engrave in the future? Are there things that you'd would find valuable and, and hope to have, and, and why? Like, what are some of the, the factors that you're considering? Like, oh, this, having this print would be really great for our trade. And then Lynn, likewise, are there things that you're hoping to do? We have prints. <laughs> I think we have some in our Many. collections, actually, from a, a guy called Rudolf Ackerman, who was a designer. 
both designer, and we have a few of those prints that would be really great to have those reproduced. That would be nice. And we have our binders bind a book, because that's actually what a coach maker would receive, as I was saying before, these fashion prints. It's kind of like a sample book. Maybe. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, <laughs> I think we could do that. Yeah. There you right. go. And you heard it here, folks. It's documented. <laughs> and we're still <laughs> looking for brick making images. That's going to be a constant, I think. Yeah, no doubt. Um, the uh, the nice thing is, I mean, outside of uh, uh, brick making, there were also builders' guides in the 18th century that uh, that basically show a uh, an apprentice or uh, somebody removed from the fashionable building trades of London. Um, how uh, architecture went together in uh, in eighteenth century uh, England. So uh, so having some of those illustrations maybe um, maybe engraved would uh, would be kind of fun. You know the different orders of architecture and things like that. Uh, sort of the uh, the the fancier things that uh, a bricklayer isn't going to learn just building things like ovens and corners on buildings, um, but uh, but all the the fancy stuff that uh, that an eighteenth century gentleman would want. Um, there's just a treasure trove of really, really awesome imagery uh, from the 18th century from these builders' guides, uh, and that would be a fantastic thing for us to, to you know, look into someday. And then, mm -hmm. again, like uh, like Paul was saying, maybe have uh, some of this stuff bound because, yeah. again, that's uh, um, you know, that was a a teaching tool in the 18th century. It's a teaching tool today in the 21st. Mm -hmm. I was reading those books. And boy, do we have ideas for apothecary. <laughs> we were just talking about that, and we're serious yeah. that um, we have um, two people that are going through the um, curriculum for our shop, and I would love for them to have some type of like certificate when they yeah. graduate, and it, based on the original certificates for the site. I think you um, can do that. Yeah, and sure. the great thing is the, one of the originals says, and diligently studied, and they went back in the 18th century, and originally that... Um, was not included. It was in, it was engraved onto the print, mm -hmm. and people attended class, but they sort of skipped classes. But they still got the certificate that says diligently attended. <laughs> so when we looked at the original for our site, says diligently attended. We go yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> our faculty was serious about his study. So for our students, yes. uh, absolutely, hundred percent. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, Rob and Josh, Paul and Lynn, all for joining us and sharing your time and your talents and your knowledge with everyone. Thank you all for watching along. Uh, this project was funded in part by a generous grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And as always, the program was made possible through the generosity of our donors. Thank you. On this Giving Tuesday, to learn how you can contribute to programs like this, please follow the links pinned to the comments or join us at colonialwilliamsburg.org. Lynn, do you have any final thoughts for us today? No, I appreciate you spending the time with us today. It's something that we're really passionate about. It's something I'm extremely passionate about. Um, and we just appreciate you taking the time and to come visit us. We've got lots of uh, neat projects going on right now. Thank you. <laughs>